From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to this week's Middle East Focus. The year hasn't started so well for Tunisia, the only Arab Spring country that did not descend into civil war or, or suffer a relapse into authoritarianism. But is it the Arab Spring's success story so many have described? Widespread protests have rocked Tunisia in recent weeks in response to a series of tax increases, exposing a general frustration among the population, who have yet to see the fruits of the 2011 revolution. While Tunisia has made major steps towards democratization, the country continues to grapple with political and economic instability. Since 2011, Tunisia has had five heads of government and living conditions for ordinary Tunisians have scarcely improved. Youth unemployment is more than 35%, and prices on basic goods and services like food and oil keep going up. Are these just the growing pains of a nascent democracy, or is Tunisia at another breaking point? To help us answer these questions, I'm joined by Asma Ghribi, a Tunisian journalist and researcher. Welcome, Asma. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, and Dohi Fasihian, a senior program manager for the Middle East and North Africa at Freedom House. Welcome, uh, Dohi. Thank you very much. Uh, and Eric Goldstein, the deputy director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa division. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me. Uh, Esma, let me uh, start with you. How do you situate these recent protests? Is there something particularly new about them, or are they just the repetition of things we've seen over past years? I would say it's a little bit of both. Because every year since the uprising, we've had these protests. And it's most of the times it's because of the same grievances. People are still having the same demands. And, and it's all because all of these successive governments, as you mentioned, have failed to address the root causes of, of Tunisia's problems. These protests are more serious. And the new thing, I think, about these protests is the response of the government. When government arrests of hundreds and I think 800 people over a week, that's not the response of a government that wants people to call it a democratic government. I hope I'm wrong. I feel like I see a new authoritarian turn mm -hmm. that Tunisia is mm -hmm. taking, and I think that's what's new. That's worrisome. And in terms of sort of who is protesting, a couple of weeks ago we had a podcast on the Iranian protests mm -hmm. and examining which groups and where, in a sense, who is protesting, um, what in a sense, class, sectors, regions? Is it a political thing? Some people say maybe some of the political parties in the run-up to the local election. How do you describe the protest side of it? I, I think the government and a lot of the, the, most of the political parties in the current ruling coalition have been trying to frame these protests as political and have been uh, accusing leftist politicians of inciting these protests. I, I don't know. Maybe. I'm not going to say the leftist politicians didn't do any of that and didn't try to seize this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that does not make the demands of these people less legitimate. And the protesters, I feel like the profile, it's, it's, the, same, it's the same people who started the revolution. because so the, they, young people, the young many people, many unemployed. unemployed. A lot of them are people with master's degree. A lot of them are people with bachelor's degree. These are educated people. And the government, these successive government failed to address their grievances. And I feel these protests are getting more and more serious. And if the government does not find a solution for this, and but at the same time, this is like a vicious circle because the government is under pressure to... Uh, take all these measures that at the same time that these the IMF, measures, that the IMF that had imposed. They have to do, sort of. In but a they sense. have yeah. to do them at the same time. And I feel all of this could probably be summarized, and this is not new because there is, let's say, like the version of the American dream in Tunisia. The Tunisian dream was that if you get a good education, there's a chance for social You'll get mobility a job for and you. you will be that set you would up. get a yeah. job in the public sector, and then the, the situation of your of your whole family would improve. This is no longer the case now, and since I think since even the late '90s, early 2000s, the Tunisian dream stopped working for many mm -hmm. people, and and that's that's what we Thank see you. now. Thank you, Eric. Let, I mean, Human Rights Watch follows obviously these issues of repression and so on very closely. Do you see kind of a new rise of sort of repression and authoritarianism? Uh, uh, what does it look like to you? I would nuance a little bit what Asma said about mm -hmm. the response by the security forces this time. 
Uh, there's no doubt that there have been human rights violations. There have been arrests of people merely for handing out leaflets. And we had somebody go to Taburba, which is a small town 20 kilometers west of Tunis, and heard about the nighttime raids and arrests of people uh, who were uh, apparently being accused of arson and, and th stone throwing and so forth. It's bad. There have been 800 arrests. Most mm -hmm. of them have been released uh, pending trial. But these are uh, protests that break out almost every year on the anniversary of the ouster of uh, President Ben Ali. Ben Ali. Yeah. And uh, what's notable to me is that despite these re repressive acts, there's been no live gunfire. There was one person who was killed in very disputed circumstances mm -hmm. in Taburba, but this is not what happened seven years ago after uh, Mohammed Bouazizi immolated himself. And you mm -hmm. saw people getting killed by live fire all over the country. And I think that there's been a kind of restraint, perhaps because the authorities fear that if there's a, a killing, it will in further inflame things, and it could be spread like wildfire across the country. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is an example of how things have remained the same. The police continue to be repressive, but things have also changed since the Ben Ali. It's mm -hmm. both at the same time. Interesting. And do you see a variation between sort of the capital Tunis and some of the regions uh, I mean, as you said, you had people go out to different areas of Tunisia. Mm -hmm. uh, are you seeing the same pattern between the capital and the regions, or is is there some variation there? We don't have yet the uh, the bird's eye view that would enable mm -hmm. us to, to compare all the different places because the protests were widespread and they were different. As Asma said, some of the protests were just unemployed youth uh, voice venting their, their, their frustration. In other places, there was a, organized political activities, leaflets, mm -hmm. political graffiti, and so forth. We're not yet at the stage where we can give a, a, an aerial view of this. Okay. And uh, Doche, at Freedom House... Uh, you look at sort of also the political conditions of, of what's going on, and it's been sort of seven years since the Tunisian transition, the only maybe successful one in the six countries that were hit by the Arab uh, uprisings. How do you see that, let's say, transition going? Is it at a standstill? Is it at risk of backtracking, or is progress being made? I think we can say that um, seven years after the revolution, Tunisia has not consolidated its democracy. I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say that. And in 2017, we saw a precipitous decline in political rights and civil liberties uh, in Tunisia. How was that manifested? Most of it is related to Tunisians not being able to impact the policies that affect their daily lives. Mm -hmm. um, well, the reason for that is, you know, the political parties um, that are governing Tunisia are not working in consultation with their constituents. It is not clear where their directives are coming. If you talk to ordinary Tunisians, they don't feel like they're working on behalf of ordinary Tunisians. By law, Tunisian political parties are supposed to announce where their financial contributions are coming. None of the political parties have been doing that regularly. They've been doing it irregularly, if at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been, you know, both domestic and international financing of these political parties without clarity Disclosure. and transparency yeah. about that. So that's a huge problem, of course. Um, there's a real sense in Tunisia that economic oligarchs are really finding their way back into influence, buying off political parties. For example, the Economic Reconciliation Bill, hugely unpopular bill that was passed uh, in September of last year. And could you explain that? that sure. Is to... That's largely a bill that um, was put forward by President Asepsi and the, both parties supported it, which basically provides for impunity, basically, for those that were in the civil service um, and in government who... In the days um, before in the, the revolution. In the Ben Ali yeah. era yeah. that um, were accused of corruption or corrupt practices. So if some of them pay, pay back some of those funds, they wouldn't be prosecuted, basically. So mm -hmm. it's largely viewed as an impunity bill protecting those that um, should be actually prosecuted. So, you know, this is just one example of a bill that was really uh, opposed by the population and by civil society that the government pushed through through uh, strong arm tactics. Um, there were several other um, events last year that were very disappointing for democratization. Um, the subnational elections were postponed, I think, for the fifth time. Now they're scheduled for May. Why have they been postponed so many times? We hear different stories as to sort of why. And of course, the government has their theory. They've been saying that they're not ready for it, that there still needs to be capacity building and that local communities aren't prepared. And when were the last local elections? There have not been local election elections. Since the oh, revolution, revolution, there haven't been. Yeah. Yeah. So, but they are scheduled uh, for the spring. 
they are scheduled yeah. for the spring. And so the hope now is that they don't push them back again. So this year, like, as I mentioned, you know, Freedom House has downgraded to some degree Tunisia, and it really is hovering between a partly free and a free country. It's still a free country, mm-hmm. uh, according to our ratings. But if it continues in the trajectory that it's going, um, we're probably not going to see it stay in this country. I mean, a lot of people were following, intrigued, impressed maybe by the coexistence between maybe the nationalist forces, if you will, national and and, and led by Mr. Asipsi and the Nahda group, the Islamist uh, uh, trend uh, that they coexisted and to some degree still uh, coexist in Tunisia in, in government as well. Uh, how would you describe that relationship now and where do you think it's headed? Is that coexistence consolidated, as you say, or is it at risk? I think it's consolidated. I mean, our view of it is that these two parties are working very closely together Mm -hmm. and they are making, they're negotiating behind closed doors. They are agreeing to certain sort of decisions on their own. And so a lot of people don't look at Nahda, for example, as the opposition party. Um, It's it's a ruling party. Mm -hmm. It's working with Nida. And so um, on most big decisions, they're going into this together. Why, you know, I think it's up for debate, but I think not. But it's take, working. And it's, it is, I mean, that part is working. I mean, maybe the results are not great. I but, don't think the res, I don't think the. Yeah. I don't think the citizenry think the results are right. great. I mean, and and the coexistence is existing. Let's put it the that coexistence way. is existing, yeah. though. But that, yeah. interesting. It's, it's not necessarily piece. a great yeah. thing. It's not for for a nascent democracy. Mm-hmm. We needed to be more. We need more competition mm-hmm. because what happened is another and the Tunis agreed to decide on whatever. They would like to decide behind closed doors, so and, they, they, and they, excluded, on, yeah. they excluded the opposition. They excluded they excluded civil society from the decision making process. I call it a dark alliance. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, honestly, for the democracy of Tunisia, and kind of an oligarchy. Or, yes, yeah. because it's like as we can see now. Before the election, this was impossible because both of their discourses were very uh, just against each other, uh, accusing each other of. Uh, for example, Nide Tunis accused the Nahda of, incil- of inciting violence and terrorism. And then Nahda was uh, accusing Nide Tunis of being the old regime and of being corrupt. And then suddenly the election happened and they were together, ruling together. And, and together they control a lot of the parliament seats. So even if the opposition wants to, let's say, block a law or whatever, they can't do that. And the proof is we have the the administrative reconciliation law. It was passed and they could do anything they want. They could. Mm-hmm. So and I think there is a consensus that the administrative recon- reconciliation law is not good for for Tunisia's mm-hmm. democracy. Mm-hmm. So I don't see the alliance between Nide and Nahda doing as a good it, thing. It's, as a it's good possibly thing. a bad thing. Eric. Yes. Uh, it's an alliance of convenience. Yeah. They, there's no love lost between those two parties, but they need each other. I think one of Tunisia's assets is that it's not a country where if there were fully free elections, there would be a tsunami victory by one party or the other. This is a country where there's a substantial minority of pro nahda people, mm-hmm. a substantial minority of people who are nida or secular or leftist. And so, forth. so they have to work, they're condemned to work together. Mm-hmm. And right now the two need each other, but within nida, uh, which has also broken into pieces, there are some ferocious anti-Islamists who would like to do what Sisi did. Yes. Okay. And in Nahda, they're ideologues and they're practical people. And Hanushi is one of the practical ones who uh, has favored this kind of collaboration. Let us govern. Let us prove our capacity to govern. We're playing a long game, not a short game here. But um, the problem with the local elections, the fact that it's been delayed and delayed and delayed is related to this because at the grassroots level, Anahda has its act together. It's mm-hmm. much more organized. And Nida is afraid that with uh, local elections, uh, uh, Nahda will gain the upper hand. And that's where you build your young cadre. Sure. You prepare them to be candidates at the national level. You, you, you're, you're good with your proximity to the local mm-hmm. population, mm-hmm. which is key to building your, your grassroots and so forth. And the parliament has been very incapable of doing it. It's a dysfunctional body. So the delay of the local elections, as well as the delay in creating a constitutional court and other national institutes, which are supposed to be arbiters and, and safeguards for democracy, is all related to this marriage of convenience where both parties are are vying for control in the upper hand. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, I think it's important to also look at, you know, the balance of power in the country, not just sort of the the political parties, which is very disappointing, is that the 
the executive is still running the country. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the parliament, um, as Eric said, is dysfunctional. It's not there's no budget for the parliament. Parliamentarians don't have an office. They don't have a staff. They're not half the time when they go to vote. They're, they're not clear what they're voting on because they haven't seen the bill or they, they're not completely understanding what they're voting on. Um, they're being sort of instructed by the prime minister's office or the head of their party to vote a certain way. They're not going to the governorates in the cities where they're supposed to be represent, representing their constituents and consulting with their constituents on their mm -hmm. viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So the parliament's not really working properly. And the judiciary is the same way. It's not working independently. It's still very corrupt. Um, it's you know different camps in the judiciary. You don't have a government with checks and balances where the parliament is, is checking the, the executive and the judiciary is uh, working independently. So a, a good amount of attention needs to be given to that if the government's going to be. They don't have the well-functioning democracy like the current U.S. government. Well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't compare it to <laughs> you the wouldn't U.S. at the moment. But <laughs> uh, Well, let me ask about I mean, civil society, that civil society in 2011 played a very enormous role. Labor unions, uh, women's groups, young sort of young people organized within civil society. We've talked about the institutions, the executive, the parties, the parliament, and so on. Esma, what's your take currently on these various parts of what we call civil society, labor, women's movement, so on? If I, I personally have any hope in Tunisia's democracy, mm -hmm. it's because not of not because of I have faith in political parties or in any other component of the Tunisian society, except for civil society groups. And they and even throughout the the process of drafting the constitution, they've been very present, defending certain values and principles. And even now they really, really mobilized and they did I feel I, they did their best during the the days leading up to the economic reconciliation law. The proof is that the law, I think they needed like three times or something. They tried to pass the law three times before they finally managed mm -hmm. to, to pass it. Why? Because of the uh, intense resistance from civil society groups. And even now, and after that, like even now, some there is some attempts to, to lead the current protests and and to have clear demands, but at the same time, I feel like the government has been is aware that there is there is some attempts to to make this the current protests more organized, and that's why the government has been trying to arrest certain people from those movement. Uh, one of the specific mo movements is called Fish Nistaneo. It means "What are we waiting for?" And that's that's a little worrying. Again, but civil society in Tunisia is very strong, but at the same time, it's very strong because political parties are very weak, mm -hmm. because people have no faith in political parties, so that's so why they, they resort to groups. civil society yeah. groups. And I'm not sure how functional and how good that for a democracy, because these, again, they're not, I feel like there should be more they're not formal, parties. yeah, yeah there yeah. should be more formal channels of expression and civil society, they, they help, but they don't play the role. Got it. Eric, on civil society, if, I mean, if, I mean, we saw in Egypt, uh, you know, a great crackdown on civil society with the NGO laws and things of that nature. Has there been similar attempts by the state to kind of rein in, or have they respected that space? Largely respected it. I agree with Asma that I would give them very high marks, but they're no substitute for functioning state institutions. They can't fill that void. Yeah. But uh, Tunisia has never been characterized uh, since the revolution by a kind of a hostility towards either local or even foreign human rights organizations mm -hmm. or uh, watchdog groups. There are effective groups that monitor the parliament uh, and uh, Balsala, for example. And um, there hasn't been this kind of hysterical rhetoric that you're just pawns of the West. I mean, it's there, but it's far from the dominant one. Human Rights Watch and many other international organizations have legal offices. We can't say that our researchers are in any way uh, uh, prevented from carrying out their work. Um, people are not arrested for their human rights activities. Even LGBT organizations function. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they haven't yes. been officially recognized, but they're operating and they're out there and everybody knows that they're out there. Oh. So it's been uh, a good period, especially compared to the Ben Ali years. Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. Uh, uh, also, you may be, want to intervene, but I wanted to also ask you to pull back and look at sort of how the U.S. and maybe the, you know, Western Europe, the world has dealt and is dealing with Tunisia. What, is, what are they getting right? What are we getting wrong? Let me just first respond to the issue of the civil society. Um, I would largely agree that um, they've been operating freely with little, little intervention by the government. But over the last two years, we have seen 
um, more scrutiny by the government, um, and some NGOs have been shut down, I think mo- mostly in this Islamist camp of the NGO community. And there's also been a move by the government to sort of reopen the the decree uh, 88 that regulates the NGO space mm-hmm. in Tunisia. And there's a real fear in Tunisia that the government is going to pass uh, a law that is more restrictive, partly because of what Asma was saying. The NGO community has been so good at being a watchdog in Tunisia and really trying very hard and effectively to keep the country on the democratic path. And so, you know, when you do have politicians um, and economic interests in the country that are trying to safeguard their own interests, there is going to be a tension there. And so there is this fear. And I would just say that it's incredibly important for Tunisian lawmakers to tackle uh, decrees and laws um, that are problematic first, and that is not Decree 88. Mm-hmm. Decree 115, for example, the freedom of expression law, is problematic. Um, there's still defamation uh, provisions in that law that are being used to prosecute journalists, to detain and intimidate journalists. So I would say that should be the first step, not Decree 88. I'd also say that the Constitutional Court immediately needs to be set up. That mm-hmm. should have been set up a long time ago, and the fact that it hasn't been set up really is not acceptable. What that really means is you don't have a high court in the country to strike down unconstitutional laws. And so when that court is set up and will hopefully be set up in 2018, first of all, it should be resourced, it should be acting independently, and it should be able to review the laws that have been passed already to be able to strike down those that are unconstitutional. In terms of the international community, I would say that the international community has been paying attention to what's happening in Tunisia. They've been generous. They should continue to be generous in terms of providing assistance to Tunisia. But I think they should make clear to Tunisian authorities what they expect. Um, and I think, for example, setting up a constitutional court is is of the utmost importance, focusing on laws um, that are still problematic in the country are important. So I would say some level of condition a- conditionalities on mm-hmm. continued assistance would be helpful. Thank you very much, Dohi. Eric, a final comment? I thank Dohi for the correction to what I said about mm-hmm. the, the risks to civil society. She's absolutely right. And I'd like to add that we haven't talked about terrorism at all yet. And it's important to mention this because with Tunisia's instability, a major terrorist attack, uh, or even if these protests were to spin out of control, this could be an opening for uh, the authoritarian tendency to gain in the upper hand mm-hmm. in Tunisia. Mm-hmm. And there is a public sentiment of revulsion at terrorism, at policemen being slaughtered and so forth. And they sometimes accused human rights organizations of being only interested in human rights for terrorists. But this could, there's a very dangerous pr- draft law now tr- uh, in, in the guise of protecting the security forces that could shut down freedom of expression that could rapidly pass in the wake of a terrorist terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. So Tunisia is not out of danger for these kinds of things. And uh, the current uh, freedom that civil society groups enjoy could be endangered by a resurgence of terrorism. There hasn't been a major attack in a couple of years, happily. We hope that continues. But these are the kinds of risks to Tunisia's democracy. Thank you for adding that uh, note of caution and for bringing in the issue of terrorism, which uh, we did not uh, we did not raise in the limited time we have. Sadly, we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. As Maghribi, a uh, Tunisian journalist and researcher, thanks for being thank with you. us. And uh, Eric Goldstein Thank from uh, the Human Rights Watch. Thanks for being here, Eric. Thank and Dukhi uh, Fasihan from Freedom House. Uh, and I thank uh, everyone for joining us uh, on this uh, podcast today. And uh, we will see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.